As you know, Herman Cain, the conservative Republican who ran credibly for the presidency of the United States, has died. He starred in my film, Uncle Tom. I had a college student ask me one time, how did you deal with color and race when you were climbing the corporate ladder? My answer, I didn't. Let them deal with it. <laughs> I didn't focus on that. I didn't have time. I went to the president of the Pillsbury Company and said, I need to get involved in some other aspects of the corporation because I want to run one of the business units one day. So he said, we need a lot of leadership in Burger King. You have to go and spend two weeks at Whopper College. That really is a Whopper College in Miami. I graduated summa cum laude. <laughs> working for the Department of the Navy. The same day that I started, another white gentleman named Robert started working there also. We had very similar jobs. So the first 12 months, I got outstanding performance four quarters in a row. The second year, outstanding performance four quarters in a row. And Robert got outstanding performance. But Robert was getting his GS salary increase at least two months sooner than me. So I went to Wayne, my supervisor, and said, Robin and I are both doing a great job. He said, yeah. So why is he getting little increases quicker than me? He said, he has a master's degree. I said, oh, it's not because he's white? Nope. He has a master's degree. So you know what I did? I didn't get mad. I went and got me a master's degree. <laughs> there are only four rooms to this flat. Went back. Sat down with Wayne, I said, well, I got a master's degree. I said, the next time you have opening for a promotion, I said, keep me in mind. See you around. And not long after that, they had a special project called a rocket assisted projector. They had to have someone who was going to be the GS-13 supervisory mathematician to do the special ballistics on this rocket assisted projector. I got the promotion. And I had eight white people working for me. It was all about performance, not the color of your skin. So since I now had that master's degree and I had proved myself, I got the job. When I decided to leave Dalgren, never forget the department head, and he called me in for an exit interview. And I never forget Russ. I think he's deceased now. He said, you know, you have taught me something. I said, what? He said, I had never worked with a black person before. You taught me don't judge somebody by the color of their skin. And in 1994, a cool, calm, collected Herman Cain introduced himself to the nation. Mr. President, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I would first like to commend you on making, making health care a national priority. Uh, in your State of the Union speech, you indicated that 9 out of 10 Americans currently have health care insurance primarily through their employers. But for many, many businesses like mine, the cost of your plan is simply a cost that will cause us to eliminate jobs. On behalf of all of those business owners that are in a situation similar to mine, my question is quite simply, if I'm forced to do this, what will I tell those people whose jobs I will have to eliminate? Do you have, are any of your employees insured now? Yes, sir. Are the Approximately uh, one third of my employees are insured now. And of the third that are insured now, what percent of payroll is their insurance cost? You. My insurance costs at the present time run approximately 2.5% of payroll. 
And uh, our, let me ask you this. On average, food service businesses, payroll is about one-third of the total cost of doing business. Is that about what it that's is? That's an adequate estimation, yes, sir. Okay, so suppose since you have part-time workers and some wouldn't have to cover it, so you wouldn't go from 2.5% two, two of payroll to 7.9%, you might go to something like 6.5%, that's a good even number, you had 4% of payroll, and that's one-third of your total cost, so you would add about 1.5% to the total cost of doing business. Would that really cause you to lay a lot of people off if all your competitors had to do it too? And why wouldn't you all be able to raise the price of pizza 2%? I'm a satisfied customer. I keep buying from you. Okay, first of all, Mr. President, with all due respect, your calculation on what the impact would do, uh, quite honestly, is incorrect. Now, let's suppose that 30% of my costs are labor costs, 7.9 times that would be the 2 to 2.5% two that you're referring to. The problem with that calculation, sir, is the fact that those, most of those 30% of the people currently have zero. It actually works out to be approximately 16%. Now, your other point about having to pass it on to my customers, in the competitive marketplace, it simply doesn't work that way because the larger competitors have more staying power before they go bankrupt than a smaller competitor. So what I'm saying and suggesting is that the assumptions about the impact on a business like mine are simply not correct because we are very labor intensive. We have a large number of part-time and short-term employees that we do not cover for one simple reason. We can't afford it. Let me ask you a favor. Would you send to me personally your calculations? Herman Cain said he wasn't poor. He couldn't afford to be poor. He couldn't afford the OR. He was po. Let me take you back to your early days. Yes. Very, very, I mean, you said it wasn't even poverty that you came up in. It was po, which is even worse than poverty. You did real good with that word. Thank you. You, you know, being <laughs> a Did I say it right? <laughs> in a you got it way. good, yeah. Po. <laughs> now, as you heard, Herman Cain was po. So was this woman who addressed a Wichita Falls city council meeting where they were considering removing a Confederate monument. She is a kindred spirit. My name is Kathy Dotson, and I don't care to get my address. But I live here in Wichita Falls. I've been living here for over 41 years. So speaking as a black person living in the city, I can honestly tell you the black folks in Wichita Falls don't care one way or another about that monument. That's the reason they're not here. They don't care. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. In 1980, I found myself living in the Ben Donnell Projects on Lincoln Street. A single mother on welfare, having to decide what to do about feeding myself and my son. I couldn't do both at the same time. I had to get on food stamps. But I worked and got better at my job. One of the proudest moments was when I walked into the welfare office and told them, I don't need these food stamps anymore. I can feed myself and my son. Fast forward 38 years. I have retired from another job. I own 17 homes right here in Wichita Falls, drive part-time for Halcon, and run a bed and breakfast. I have made a success out of my life through hard work and perseverance. I want you to know that my success came in and happened in spite of that rock sitting in the front yard of Memorial Auditorium. That monument is just a rock. It's not good. It's not bad. It don't have the ability to be a racist. And it don't have control over anybody. It's just a rock. The issue
issue of removing the statue is a distraction. It's an excuse to dismantle this city. If it comes down, there will be something else and something else and something else and something else to please these terrorist young folks. If Black Lives Matter, then instead of focusing on this rock, let's focus on the black men sitting on the curb in front of Faith Mission every day. Let's make them more self-sufficient. If Black Lives Matter, then you would help black people in the area of their need. Like paying the rent, keeping food on the table, paying the electric bill in this 100 degree heat. That would be more beneficial. These white folks, outsiders, yelling, and are making their remarks in the street that black lives matter. But you ain't doing nothing about it but opening your mouth and running your mouth. That's all they doing. That's all those outsiders is doing. Your white BLM members is tearing down the city or wants to tear down the city for their own political agenda. And you got your little black sheeps tagging along behind you. Bad, bad black sheep, have you any wool? Do you have what it takes to ask the question as to why are you following behind these folks trying to bring division and tear down Wichita Falls? These are college educated people protesting that monument. Can they spend their time instead teaching financial literacy to black people and other minorities? Okay, it makes, it makes me mad for a movement to use black people as an excuse for their own political agenda to tear up and tear down. Wherever black lives matter goes, they leave a trail of destruction. Let me say this before I run out of time. I come from welfare to fair and well with, a monu with that monument in place. Actually, from welfare to millionaire. And never once thought that monument was holding me back. And the news media covering and fighting us over, and the news media covering us fighting over a rock in the front yard. Councilman, don't fall for it. Please don't go for that. These people have a different agenda. And it ain't to help the black people in this town or any minority. Thank you. <laughs> Star is born. I wonder if she made the short list of VP picks for Joe Biden. Now, these young social justice warriors, the one in the streets burning and sometimes looting, do they have any idea what real racism is? Do they have any idea what people like MLK experienced growing up in the Deep South? What were you really prevented from doing as a child that a white child might have done? Well, in my uh, days in Atlanta as a child, there was a pretty strict system of segregation. Uh, for instance, I could not use uh, the swimming pool so that uh, for a long, long time I could not go and swim in until uh, the YMCA was built, a Negro YMCA, and they had a swimming pool there. But certainly a Negro child in Atlanta could not go to any public park. Uh, I could not uh, go to the so-called white schools. There were separate schools. And I attended a high school in Atlanta, which was the only high school for Negroes in the city. Uh, and this was a real problem because in Atlanta there are more than 200,000 Negroes. In many of the stores downtown, to take another ex example, uh, I could not go to a lunch counter. 
uh, to buy a hamburger, a cup of coffee, or something like that. Uh, I could not attend any of the theaters. Only uh, there were one or two Negro theaters. Uh, they were very small, but uh, they did not get the main pictures. If they got them, they were two years late or three years late. So that, uh, by and large, there was a very strict system of segregation, and uh, there was nothing called racial integration at that time in Atlanta. And what about violence towards him or witnessing violence toward others? Now, that's a description of the system. Was anybody actually cruel to you or violent to you because you were colored? Yes, uh, we did confront some of those problems. Uh, I remember as a child seeing uh, problems of police brutality. And uh, this was mainly aimed at Negro children and uh, Negro adults. Uh, I can remember also uh, the organization that is known as the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, this is an organization that stands on white supremacy and uh, an organization that in those days even uh, used violent methods uh, to preserve segregation and to keep the Negro in his place, so to speak. Now, I can remember seeing the Klan actually beat uh, Negroes on some of the streets uh, in Atlanta. But nobody ever beat you personally? No, I never, I did have one experience, uh, which was a relatively minor experience, but it still uh, lived with me a good deal. When I was uh, about eight years old, I was in one of the downtown stores of Atlanta, and uh, all of a sudden, someone slapped me, and the only thing I heard was somebody saying, uh, you are that nigger that stepped on my foot. And uh, it turned out to be a white lady. And uh, of course, I didn't retaliate at any point. I finally went and told my mother what had happened, and she was very upset about it. But uh, at that time, uh, the lady who slapped me had gone, and uh, uh, my mother and I left the store almost immediately. Can you remember at this distance of time uh, why you didn't uh, respond in any violent way? Was it that you'd already thought of nonviolence, or was it that you just didn't dare as a Negro to, to take any strong action against a white? Well, I think probably it was a combination of two things. I hadn't thought of nonviolence at that early age as a, as a system of thought, uh, as a practical technique. Uh, I think uh, a great part of it was that uh, uh, I just uh, didn't think uh, I wouldn't dare uh, retaliate uh, or hit back when a white person was involved. And uh, I think some of it was a part of my uh, native structure, so to speak, and that is that uh, I have never been one to hit back too much. And you know, he was criticized by some activists for being insufficiently militant. Some of your critics do say that you lack fire. I've heard that said about you, that uh, you're not really keen on challenging except on the margins of this problem. Now, I expect that's unfair, but I'd like to hear your answer to it. Well, I don't know if I lack fire. Uh, I do feel that at times I, I am rather soft and maybe a little gentle, but uh, on the other hand, I have uh, strongly advocated uh, direct action. Uh, I have made it clear that I believe this is uh, one of the most potent weapons available to oppress people for, in their struggle for freedom uh, and human dignity. So that uh, uh, I don't consider this a marginal approach. I consider this a, as an approach going to uh, the very depths. I have uh, participated in sit-ins myself. I have been arrested as a result of my participating in sit-ins with the students at lunch counters. Uh, I served as one of the coordinators of the Freedom Rides, so that uh, I don't think uh, it is true to say that uh, I am not uh, in accord with these particular methods. I believe in them and I have advocated them and participated in them. As for the growing criticism near the end of his career from young activists who felt he was insufficiently militant, Here's what he said. Now what I'm saying is this. I would like for all of us to believe in nonviolence, but I'm here to say tonight 
that if every Negro in the United States turns against nonviolence, I'm going to stand up as a lone voice and say this is the wrong way. So we have gone from MLK to this? No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! To repeat. Now what I'm saying is this. I would like for all of us to believe in nonviolence, but I'm here to say tonight that if every Negro in the United States turns against nonviolence, I'm going to stand up as a lone voice and say this is the wrong way. What a man. And so was Herman Cain. Rest in peace. Now to see the full film, Uncle Tom, just go to UncleTom.com. I'm Larry Elder. And we've got a country to save. I'll see you next time.